Paperback Rocker, episode 64. Hey, this is Matt Severson, the Paperback Rocker, and I'm broadcasting from my 6 by 9 foot cinder block shack in the desert of northern Mexico, southern Texas. Welcome and thanks for checking out my show. Fueled by espresso and popsicles, British rock, and Earl Grey, the paperback rocker. Hey everybody, what's up? It's your old friend Matt, a.k.a. the paperback rocker, back with another installment of my novel, Blue Whiskey. And when we last read, um, Ruben had just uh heard Stanton play guitar for the first time and was amazed and then they talked and realized that uh, Stanton had never written his own song or anything like that and so I'll just jump into the scene I'm going to backtrack a couple uh, paragraphs from where I actually stopped last time it's going to be on the bottom of page 49 in the hardback and paperback Reuben said nothing for a time, but continued to work the Swizzler with his teeth. It's obvious I have to teach you, he said, with the resignation and enthusiasm of a doomed man. You are a blank slate, Stanton, a piece of stupid clay. You said that many times last night, I said, remembering the phrase. I most certainly did nothing of the sort, wheelhouse. You wouldn't let me get a word in sideways. My God, man. He looked at me with an expression that can only be described as mortified disgust. I'm sorry, Reuben, I said with much hidden exasperation. Reuben said, you, Stanton, are a man-child. You dwell in a dual state of existence, half man and half child. You won't even understand the statement, for you know nothing of the Steppenwolf. The Steppenwolf, I asked? That sounded interesting. Will you teach me? I cannot give you a lesson on the duality of man as I stand here before you like naked Adonis. He turned and walked away, and I was sure I heard him mutter, Stupid clay. You are most definitely a wolf of the steppes, said the son of Faulkner. Reuben knows what he's talking about. The son of Faulkner and I sat in silence for long moments while Reuben was hopefully clothing himself upstairs. Finally, Reuben burst from the door to his apartment and rushed up to me. You have the foundation, Reuben said, but you have no worldly experience. It's quite a beautiful dilemma, for me at least. I have always wanted a protege. If I ask you to do something, do you promise to do it? Of course. In retrospect, I have no means to explain my faith in Reuben after such a short time. But he held some power over me, even at this early juncture in our relationship. To the best of your ability, will you take my direction without question? You are my master, I said. Reuben eyed me suspiciously, but nothing in my demeanor seemed to spark any warning flares in him. I want you to go out into New Orleans today and observe. (laughs) I won't tell you what. Experience something, no matter how trivial. You've got the day off. I need to open the bar and Faulkner needs a drink. Tomorrow morning before work, I want you to meet us here with your first song, composed by you about today's experience. But Reuben, I said, what if I'll not entertain excuses, Stanton? You said you'd take my direction without question. Now run along and do as I say. Try to think like an artist. I wandered out into New Orleans from the back door of the Thirsty Possum with Reuben's acoustic in hand. I knew not where to go. But my nose led me to the water. I found myself wandering on a wooden boat deck, admiring the sailboats and commercial fishing vessels moored to it. I was strolling along, thinking about how to satisfy Reuben's order, when a man called to me from a shrimp boat. It had its name, Miss Lucy, on the side. Yes, I answered. 
Day laborer? He asked. I said, what's the pay? Twenty bucks and some catch. I had never been on a boat, but f I felt my father's sailor blood in me reach high tide. You've got it, I said. An hour later, we had been on the water twenty minutes, and I was violently seasick. I plumed the liver hangover cure off the back of the boat like a grotesque fountain cherub. When I could offer the sea no more of my bounty, I stumbled to the cabin of the vessel and crumpled in a fetal pile. I heard the voices of hundreds of birds swooping in and out near the boat, which made me confused. I was in a horrible state of being. Drop the nets, the captain hollered to his first mate. He looked tall from my vantage point near his feet. You ain't getting two dollars of that twenty, he said to me with disgust. Grrrr, I groaned before passing out. Thank heaven I fell into a much welcomed sleep, and the rocking of the ship changed from my curse to my ally. It was the best rest since leaving home, and I dreamed a full menu of pleasant episodes. I woke after what I estimated to be an hour, and felt fit as the proverbial fiddle. I rose and made my way to the aft of the vessel, to offer a hand to the captain and the mate. I found them hard at work, sorting shrimp into different colored baskets. Their hands were a blur. We're on the shrimp, yelled the mate when he saw me. You chummed em, chum. The man, who was thin and small with patchy white hair, turned his head to the side and placed a finger against one of his nostrils and blew a mass overboard. If I'd had any of the liver left in me, it would have followed. Chum, the captain said with a hoarse laugh, glaring at me with a wild expression and a battered cigar in his mouth. How can I help, I asked, not understanding. You already helped, chum, the vile mate said. You helped, chum. Chum, the captain said again with a cackle. I took a place between, beside the two of them and watched until I felt knowledgeable enough to help, then mimicked what they did. When we had finished sorting the huge pile, the captain yelled, Raise the net, stubs. Aye, captain, the mate said. The enthusiasm the mate exhibited in his lively actions informed me that he was profiting from a percentage of the catch, as no hourly employee would move so quick. As the nets on each side of the boat were winched to the surface, he cried, Full again, Captain! They were hauled on deck and emptied, and another huge pile of wiggling pink, pink crescents was in front of us making clicking sounds. The captain lowered the nets back into the water as Stubbs and I approached the sorting table. We batched the shrimp more quickly this time and culled very few, with six skilled hands instead of four. When the task was complete, the nets were raised and found to be full once again, but they were not lowered back into the gulf after being emptied. Once again we sorted, tossing fish and the occasional crab overboard, and once again the job took less time than the time before. Captain Hess, let's drop the nets again, first mate Stubbs begged. Without the distraction of the clicking shrimp, I examined Stubbs again and found him to be the most repulsive man I'd ever set eyes upon. The captain took the unlit cigar out of his mouth and said, Riding low in the water as it is, hold is full. Been out long enough. It's hot. Can't take a chance on the catch spoiling. It's time to enjoy ourselves, Stubbs said to me, placing his hand on my shoulder. It made my skin crawl. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a deck of cards. Go fish, penny a page. The ride back was slow due to the full load. Having miraculously conquered seasickness, I considered that I may have been food poisoned by the liver I drank earlier in the day. Either way, it worked out well for me and bad for the shrimp, so I was satisfied. The sun shone down and my skin embraced it like an old friend as I sat on a wooden ice chest on the work deck of the ship. Stubbs and I played Go Fish all the way back. He was too dumb to notice I wasn't even looking at my cards. When we reached the dock, the ship was deftly maneuvered into its slot and Stubbs bravely leaped onto the platform to hitch the vessel to a cleat. Captain Hess and Stubbs begged me to return the following morning for a replay, but I assured them I would not be heaving liver again any time soon. Captain Hess insisted I take a large bag of fresh shrimp, but I imagined what I might be forced to do with them when I reached the thirsty possum, so I asked for a rain check. 
I was too tired to clean shrimp and prepare a meal. Before I left, Captain Hess turned his back to Stubbs so the repulsive man could not witness his action and handed me forty dollars with a wink. Come back any time you need to make some money, he said. Come back, chum, called Stubbs from the other side of the boat and laughed in his vulgar way. I walked to an inactive spot on the dock and sat down to compose my thoughts and write my song. I could hear Captain Hess and Stubbs working, unloading and preparing Miss Lucy for the next day's outing. Thoughts are much easier to compose than songs, I concluded, so I strolled along the water for a while. I came to an out-of-place bench, which looked to be just a spot to watch the water and the comings and goings upon it. I later found out my father and the captain sat on, that, on this same bench together many years before, but I had no way of knowing that at the time. I think the bench's memory of the event connected something between my father and the captain and me, and that resulted in me becoming inspired. I sat there strumming Rubin's, Rubin's guitar. It was cheap, but it had a warm sound and was staying in tune pretty well. Holding, a, holding tune is hard for an inferior instrument, but it performed nobly. How does one write a song, I wondered. There wasn't a name for it at the time, but I came to my own nameless conclusion, what is now called brainstorming. I played random chords and let my mouth fumble out accompanying thoughts as melodies. The shrimp and the whale have a story to tell, a story, a tale, and a flipper as well, I sang. I thought that was pretty good. The fish and the whale swim under our sail, catch one and win, catch the other and fail. I was in a sort of trance brought on by the sun and exhaustion. Hey, that works, I said with a smile, happy with myself. I've got two lines, let's go for the third. I sang the first two lines and added, Sea life swim under the swell, sea life has a story to tell. It was a bit repetitious and in danger of becoming a tongue twister. But the, glowing, but the glow of artistic creation was hot inside me for the first time. Like other first times in life, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was enthusiastic. <laughs> I couldn't believe what had come out of my mouth. It was golden genius. I hurried to complete my masterpiece, which took another 15 minutes, then rushed back to the thirsty possum to present it to my master and the poisoner, Faulkner, if he was awake. I heard the noise of the saloon half a block before I arrived. It was Tuesday happy hour, and the possum was promoting half-priced local brew, so the place was packed with loose people who were tight, if you savvy. I wandered in feeling self-conscious due to the overwhelming odor of fresh self shellfish, that was my chaperone. Not an eye was batted in my direction since many others in the joint smelled similar, whether from work on a boat or in a kitchen. Reuben acknowledged me with a wave from behind the bar, then pointed at passed out Faulkner and shook his head, smiling. I stashed the guitar behind the bar and went to work, gathering empty beer bottles from tables, and kept myself busy the rest of the night. I dressed in the Chevy comfortably, or... I drowsed in the Chevy comfortably that night with the son of Faulkner sleeping hunched in the front passenger seat. When I woke the next morning, he was gone. The son told me it was nine or ten. When I walked through the back door of the possum, I saw Reuben and Faulkner sitting at the bar with half-full pint glasses of the liver concoction. Or maybe they were half-empty. Stanton's here, wait, Stanton's here for the cure, the son of Faulkner practically sang. Not in your life, I said. He's here to play us his song, reminded Reuben. Ah, yes, the son of Fox said the son of Faulkner. I'm on pins. I'm on needles, Reuben said with a devious smile. He reached down and produced the instrument, which he held out to me with an expression like that of a cat within reach of a sparrow. I walked slowly across the distance and took the guitar. Sit on the bar and play, he ordered. I handed the guitar back to him and hitched myself up on the bar and put one foot on a stool and just let and let the other hang. It's not completely finished, I said, taking the six string back from Reuben. Nonsense, we know you haven't perfected it. Just play what you got, Stanton, said my master. I took an extraordinary amount of time checking the tuning with hands shaking, then launched into the shrimp and the whale. I purposefully closed my eyes to avoid the glances Reuben and Faulkner were surely exchanging like bad Christmas presents. 
I kept him clinched when I finished, like a dog awaiting a slap from a rolled-up newspaper. When I found the courage to lift my lids, I saw smiles on their faces and relaxed. Bravo, Stanton. That was hor horrible, said Reuben. Shitty, added what I now consider the bastard son of Faulkner. Thanks, I said, fighting back tears, as if either of you could do better. I thrust the guitar into Reuben's arms and jumped down from the bar to leave. What's this? said Reuben with a shocked look. I'm getting the hell out of here, I said. You can find some other Rube to make fun of. Tut, tut, Stanton, he said, which came across as dismissive and patronizing. I better stop because there's no place to get out of that scene. So we'll pick up there next time. Thanks for being with me. As always, we just finished page 55. Uh, see you next time. The paperback rocker has signed off.